Greetings, travelers. This is the Midnight Rider. I know it's been a long time, but, uh, well, I've been... I've been somewhat busy. But I have something here that I want to share, and you can make of it what you will. I have a tale to tell. It may seem strange. I read the parable of the talents, and I was inspired. Some would call such an alteration a blasphemy. I will leave such labels to you, the reader, or in this case, the listener. I call it, one is the hardest number. One. There was an executive who was going to be traveling to a remote mountain estate for an extended time and wanted to ensure that his interests would not suffer in his absence. He had been carefully monitoring his employees, looking for one with signs of potential, and had decided on these three in particular. He called them to his office. I've been watching your careers with great interest, and I'd like to give each of you a chance to expand the leadership skills you've demonstrated. He assigned each of them a number of bars of gold. Each chosen amount is a reflection of the ability I see in you, he said to them in the warm and supportive tone that had named him CEO Quarterly's favorite boss for, well, forever, it seemed. After the executive departed, the three promotees began to compare their prizes. I got five bars, you guys, the first employee crowed. How did you do? Oh, I, uh, I only got two, the second man said glumly. Still, it should be enough to start those projects he and I had talked about. The third man remained silent. Kevin? The second man, James, asked expectantly. James knew Kevin was brilliant, and, if we're being honest, he wanted to hear how well Kevin had done just to wipe that smug grin off of Michael's face. Kevin spun the briefcase, which had a K engraved delicately in the metal clasp. In it, centered in the black foam padding which filled the rest of the case, lay a single golden rectangle with a curious mark. One? James blurted out, shocked. One, Kevin sighed. In his face was all the pain of the unappreciated. I thought I was doing so well. The old man and I spent most of a lunch meeting together, and I was sure he was picking my brains. He asked me what sort of world I'd like to see, and I told him everything. And now, he sulked, waving at the briefcase, this? What am I supposed to do with that? That won't even make a dent in the operating costs I'd have to lay out to start the things we talked about. Two. The executive was gone for the better part of the year. The day he burst breathlessly into the office like a whirlwind, he called his three protégés in. His skin was flushed with both a suntan, from the high-altitude sunlight he'd been living in for the past year, and a palpable excitement. It's good to be back, gentlemen. Now tell me, how go your projects? Michael was eager to announce his successes, 100% annual profit, boss, he grinned. Total holdings of my division are now 10 bars. The executive clapped him on the back. Great work, Michael. I'm promoting you to co-vice president. James cleared his throat. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I had great success with the bakery idea, he stammered. We've only got four bars now, but we've still got room to grow. And technically, that is also 100% annual profit, uh, sir. The executive laughed and clapped him on the back. Great work, James. I'm promoting you to co-vice president. All eyes swiveled to look at Kevin. Kevin sat, seemingly uninterested in the entire affair, fastidiously trimming a ragged fingernail with a pocket file. The executive seemed fit to burst with anticipation. 
which James found a little hard to watch. Of course, the boss had been out of the country, incommunicado, for a whole year, so he hadn't watched the gradual decline of Kevin as his bitterness ate away what had so recently been a bright sheen of promise. Don't keep me in suspense, Kev, the boss prompted. How did it go? After an uncomfortable moment, Kevin put his nail file back into his pocket. Go? How was I supposed to make anything go anywhere with one bar? The facility for the energy generation plant alone would have cost me eight bars all by itself. I couldn't do anything with just one bar. So I got Janice to put it there, pointing at the floor safe beneath the executive's chair. Safe and sound, your one bar is in your own vault. You're sitting on it. The boss looked crestfallen. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin, he began. As a matter of fact, technically it's less than one bar, Kevin went on, building up steam as he unleashed a dam burst of built-up frustration. Because your custom monogram changed the weight of it. Did you know that the commodity dealers don't like to trade in bullion, which has been modified? Is that why, in the inscription on the bottom, you forbade me from melting it down? Tears were flying from Kevin's face now. His cheeks were heated to a feverish red, and his eyes were wide as he began to shout. Did you want me to fail? Was that the lesson I was supposed to learn? That you just don't like me? You know what? Fine. If you thought my ideas were dumb, fine. You could have just said so. And with that, Kevin stormed out of the office, slamming the door behind him. The wired, shatter-resistant safety glass rattled menacingly in the pane, sounding the finality of Kevin's resignation. Three. The boss wasn't the same after that day. James watched as he moved the last of his personal effects, relocating out of the local office. He had told James and Michael to visit his mountain retreat whenever they liked, but he told them the altitude was preferable to unpleasant associations. Michael's division assumed control of the central plant, including the boss's old office, and the floor safe within, and the unusable talent slept within the dark and forgotten office, which no one else seemed to feel comfortable in. Four. James told his wife, back on the day of the storm, that as soon as Michael learned of his de facto possession of Kevin's talent, for so it had come to be called, with proper noun status and capitalization in all their minds, he had told James, Correction, James, 120% annual profit, and had held up his hand for a quick high five. James had pretended not to notice. But the matter never rested well with James. He had never actually seen the inscription that Kevin had referred to. No one had. And thinking about it, it gnawed at James. The boss was not a cruel man. It was not like him to set someone up to fail, and he had seemed genuinely hoping to hear Kevin report good news, despite Kevin's protestation of the impossibility of there being good news. James had offered Michael one gold bar to acquire the executive's office. Where's the profit for me there? One bar for one bar. Give me two, and you've got yourself a deal. James cringed, remembering Michael's victorious exclamation as he had left with the key to the office. Correction, James! 142%! 5. A quick three-party call got Janice to give him the combination to the safe. He stood at the desk, the velvet pouch lying there in the lamp's glow, nestling its golden treasure in violet darkness. James released the drawstring and removed the bar. He set it gingerly down on the desk, focused the spot of the lamp onto it, and looked at it. It was not a simple piece of bullion, 
There were no registration numbers on it, no certification stamp from whatever bank guaranteed its authenticity. It had taken some legwork on James' part, but he had bribed a gossipy secretary with donuts to get the details of its construction. The boss had made a casting, formed using his own finger on a beach to write his own initial in the sand. The secretary had assured him that it was actual size, and of course the boss signed all of his official documents the same way, a single first initial. James could believe it. The grooves were wide and deep. The boss was no willowy lad, and James could visualize him slashing the bold strokes into the sand. He turned the bar over, revealing the hidden message. Kevin, I know what you can do. This is your chance to show you. I've made it a little tougher for you because I want you to train yourself. I want you to show yourself you can follow in my tracks. You can do it. P.S. Don't just melt this down to sell it. That won't get us there. Think about it. Six. James... <clears throat> James couldn't get it out of his head. The words on the bar cycled over and over in his mind. It was like a little pull in a sweater, a little distortion, a little lump. But your fingers keep smoothing it out all day. The traditional phrase was, follow in my footsteps. The boss was a cultured man, a world traveler, who was familiar with all the subtleties of the idiom. He would not make such a mistake. Why tracks? He wrestled with the problem in his sleep. He was dreaming of a tiny version of himself, trapped in the grooves on the gold bar, doomed forever to walk back and forth along the tracks of his own footsteps in the gold. As he trudged his path, a giant finger came out of the sky and descended towards him, and he awoke suddenly. Follow in my tracks, he exclaimed, as, as he bolted upright in bed. Seven. What? What are you talking about? Kevin demanded of the brightly glowing square on his phone. The square danced and sang in a universe all its own. Follow in my tracks, James shouted at him. When you run your finger down the track, signing his signature the way he does it, the way he did it on the beach, the box opens. Inside are some of the highest grade gems anyone has ever seen. The actual value of just the gems is roughly equal to about 13 gold bars. The square flickered as James whirled the camera around the room. On every wall, there were blown-up drawings of every kind, inventions not only like the ones Kevin had dreamed up, but everything the boss had ever pondered. An infinity of possibilities, all signed and transferred to Kevin in miniaturized form on the tiny piece of technology nestled among the gems. He wanted you to succeed, the square shouted as it sailed through space. The screen upon which it lived its brief flickering existence falling to the floor from Kevin's limp and numbed fingers as he stood in astounded amazement. It's not too late. I hope you enjoyed our little story. If you would like to see more of this kind of story, let me know. Leave a message. Comment on the video below. The only way I'm going to know if people like this thing is if they say something. And uh, if you really like it, share it with somebody else. It'll help. 
that's it for now.